tell us a little bit more about China's moves here. It, it, does it make the country a more serious contender in the global space race? Sure. Good morning. And I would say definitely having its own large and uh, long-term space station is, is a big move. So China's previous two space stations, Tiangong-1 and Tiangong-2, were both designed to be sort of transitionary space stations that were developing and, and uh, verifying a few different technologies. And so now having this third space station, which again is quite a bit more uh, long-term in its nature, I mean, not, not necessarily permanent, but but uh, long-term, uh, I think that's definitely a, a, big, uh, a big step forward. And to your colleague's earlier point, the ISS is potentially going to be decommissioned in the next few years, which could make this even more significant. Blaine, Steve Engel here. What do you think is going to be the main purpose of uh, Tiangong, the, the more recent iteration of the space station? Is it going to be commercial, military? Uh, is it going to be scientific? What do you think? There, there are some you know, speculation uh, from U.S. military officials about its end aim, but what do you think it's going to be its uh, main goal? Sure. So I think primarily we could think about two main goals. The first one would be sort of scientific uh, scientific research, and there's a lot of different experiments that are going to be conducted on Tiangong-3, and a lot of them are actually being done with international partners. So there's an interesting document that was published by the UN Out uh, Office of Outer Space Affairs that talks about different uh, scientific experiments. And so I think that's a big element of the space station. And to your earlier point about the size relative to ISS, it is definitely smaller, but it's also built in a more efficient way in some areas, which will make it, uh, I guess, in terms of sort of bang for its buck, the research output should be quite significant. So again, first main idea would be scientific research. I think the second point would be sort of national pride and soft power, both domestically and also internationally. So I think there's a lot of potential to fly uh, Taikonauts or astronauts from other countries to the Chinese space station. And I do think there's also a lot of national pride at the moment in China towards their space program. And I think having you know, a, a human space flight and having a you know, human space station is, is quite a big part of that too. Blaine, Juliet here in Singapore. You talk about national pride there too. What about geopolitical concerns though about uh, the Chinese space station and other plans for bases on the moon here? Sure. So in terms of geopolitical concerns, I mean, there's there's always this kind of tension between the U.S. and China in, in many different uh, areas of, of life and economy, and I guess space is no exception to that. I do think that some of the concerns that were brought up around the space station were a little bit... Um, a little bit overblown, let's say. So, for example, the space station is equipped with this sort of robotic arm, and there was a, I forget which U.S. Um, politician, but was talking about the potential for this robotic arm to like grapple satellites in orbit and, and you know decommission them. And like, I mean, it's it's theoretically possible, but it would it's very, very, very unlikely and, and extremely difficult. To, to do that. So so I think some of the, the sort of geopolitical concerns around the space station are a little bit overblown. I think in terms of uh, like, for example, a lunar research base or just, you know, human exploration of the moon, that could be a little bit more strategically concerning just from the in the sense that like we're hearing a lot now about China and Russia having a joint moon research base. And that would be, you know, it would represent a significant threat, I guess, to the sort of U.S. space dominance up until now, I think. So, um, but even then, I mean, the moon is a very large place. And from a, right. you know, from a research perspective, it's, yeah, it's hard to imagine there being that much of an issue. Hey, Blaine, Steve here again. I know, the, you know, the Chinese have often used the word exploitation of the moon. Of course, they want to harvest some of the natural resources and the like. But what are some of the more practical commercial uh, end results from the space race, if you will? Because we know Elon Musk is pushing Starlink to get the LEO, uh, the low orbit, uh, you know, uh, satellite network for a, a broadband. Uh, in fact, Lei mm. Jun, uh, Galaxy Space, it's a Chinese uh, billionaire who, who and, of course, uh, Xiaomi, he's launching his own powerful LEO satellite for 5G. We know that Amazon has Project Kuiper. A number of companies have tried to get into LEO 5G. OneWeb has, has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. LEOSat has collapsed. W wh where are we going to be? That's a lot of space industry companies to hear on Bloomberg, so I'm glad, glad that you've done your homework there. But um, I think definitely in terms of the, the sort of commercial economic impact of, of what's happening in space right now, so there, there's two points, and I, your point about LEO broadband is important. I'll get to it in just a second. But I think the first point that's worth mentioning is this dramatic decrease in the cost of access to space, so that 
price of launch. Uh, and this has been led by SpaceX in the U.S. I mean, they've, they've really significantly decreased the cost to get to space, and that is something that is going to only continue as they build more rockets. And in China, you see a lot of rocket companies that are planning to build 20, 30, 50 rockets per year by, like, mid-decade. And so at that point, you're going to see just this probably this dramatic decrease in, in cost of access to space. And that's going to enable a lot of different things to be done in orbit that previously were just prohibitively expensive. And one of the things is going to be the sort of global low Earth orbit broadband constellation business model, to your point. And certainly um, the Starlink is the leader in that right now. Uh, OneWeb, they, they did exit chapter 11 uh, about six months ago. And so they're kind of back on their feet and they're launching satellites. Um, in China, we recently saw the announcement, this would, been, that would have been in April of this year, of a company called SatNet, uh, so Zhongguo uh, Xinwang. Uh, and SatNet, it was going to be a kind of Chinese version of, of Starlink or Kuiper. There's not a huge number of details available at the moment, but we are seeing, um, to your earlier point, different companies in China, such as Galaxy Space or ComSat or some of the state-owned satellite manufacturers, building up the capabilities to build 100 or 200 satellites per year within the next few years. So I think we're definitely going to start seeing more commercial use of, of space for just general purposes because of this decreased cost of access to space and also potentially for you know global broadband internet access, which is something that is probably still very necessary in a lot of the world.